Good afternoon and welcome to Scotia iTrades webinar. Today's topic is on income focused investing using ETFs with Horizons ETFs. Before we begin, we're just going to take care of some quick uh, house cleaning items. If you're having any difficulties with your audio, uh, you can always just click on the sound check link uh, to make sure that's working okay for you. If you've called in using, uh, if, you've, if you're using your computer and you're having any difficulties uh, with the audio, you can always use the telephone, uh, use the, uh, use the uh, PIN number and your access code, give us a phone call, and you can always enjoy the session that way as well too. So as always, uh, we're muted for sound quality purposes. Um, so, we won't be able to have any conversations per se. However, we do get a chance to use the control panel. Um, if you notice that the control panel disappears, you can just use the arrow at the top uh, to click on that. It'll be reappearing for you. Otherwise, you can also, um, you can also view in full screen mode. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, you can just use the uh, question panel box to uh, let us know about that. As a quick reminder, Scotia iTrade does not provide investment or tax advice or recommendations. Nothing in the presentation is or should be construed as investment or tax advice or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security or to follow any particular investment strategy. The presentation here is for information purposes only. So as mentioned, you can use the arrow at the top to uh, minimize or to expand the control panel you can view in full screen mode as well too. You can also use the hand icon to signal if you've got a question, but preferably you'd prefer to just type in that question box as, as you see on the screen here, and the presenter will either answer the questions immediately or uh, will leave the questions to a Q&A session at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, webinar. So we are gonna be recording today's session as well. A link will be emailed out within one business day. Alternatively, you can just visit our YouTube channel, Webinars On Demand Playlist, to see uh, any of our archived uh, webinars that are there. Or you can always email us at education at scotiaitrade.com to request a copy of the uh, recording. So you also uh, can take notes. Um, however, we will be uh, downloading a PDF file for this presentation at the end of the session. Uh, you'll be able to use that to follow along if you want to uh, view this presentation following. So today we're uh, happy to have with us Mark Noble. He's the head of sales strategy, the VP communications and public relations at Horizons Exchange Traded Funds. Um, Mark has been with Horizons for more than four years and uh, he's responsible for his external communications and sales strategy. He's also the chair of the marketing and communications committee of the Canadian ETF Association. Mark is a strong proponent of financial literacy and ETF education he works closely with Horizons sales and marketing teams to build out client education tools and initiatives that help Canadians become better ETF investors. Prior to working at Horizons ETFs, Mark was a personal finance journalist at the Advisor Group, which is a leading financial services publication that serves the Canadian financial advisor market. So at this time, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Mark and he'll be able to facilitate the remainder of the session. I'll close up at the end. If there's any other questions there, we can address them at that point as well. Mark, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Conleaf. Uh, <clears throat> always a pleasure to be working with Scotia iTrade on these presentations, and uh, this is actually one of my favorites to do. It's on income investing, which you know is, is something which should be intuitively simple, but I find that ends up being a lot more complicated. Uh, than it should be for a lot of investors. So we usually have a lot of questions on this one. Uh, part of my voice today, I'm just getting over uh, the uh, seasonal illness, I guess, de jour. But uh, <clears throat> hopefully I'm clear. i just probably not as loud as I usually am. And um, if you have any questions, I will try to answer them as we go along. But, um, you know, things tend to go pretty fast. So I will get to them at the end if I can. So uh, patience if you've asked a question. I'm not, I'm not actively ignoring you. And uh, final piece, this is a lot of content that we're going to cover today. Uh, some of it will cover some of the ETFs that my firm offers. I always like to put a caveat before I start that 
you know, I work for Horizons ETFs, and clearly I'm incented to uh, sell Horizons ETFs products, but I'm hoping that the educational component of this presentation shines through. So any ETFs that I have here that are used by us are, you know, I'm going to highlight their benefits, but also realize that they're somewhat of a placeholder for ETFs that could be used by other providers. So I'm using them as an example of the type of strategies that could uh, be utilized in your portfolio. I'm not necessarily there to pound the table on you buying those ETFs. Sure, certainly that's always a great ancillary benefit, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here to educate. So we're going to cover a few items. We're going to cover um, what I call the new realities of income investing. and It's not the greatest reality for income investing. Uh, the impact of fees on income investing. It's an overlooked topic and important. And then we're going to talk about different types of ETF strategies to get exposure, uh, the, the advantages of active management and fixed income, and of course, maybe some of the income ETFs available through Horizons. But you know, the first four points is really what we're going to focus on today. And uh, hopefully, you get a better understanding of some of the ways that you can tweak your portfolio using ETFs to generate better risk-adjusted yield. And when I talk about yield, of course, I'm talking about the type of income you can generate from some of these investment strategies. So if we look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if we look at you know where things are at today. You know, one of the things that we can't ignore, despite all the noise about, you know, equity valuations and low interest rates and all these different types of, um, of factors that, that work their way into, you know, how much instruments pay on income, is the fact that Canadians, and this actually holds true for most Europeans, certainly in Japan, as well as in the United States, um, a percentage of people in the Western world and percentage of Canadians 65 and older is continuing to grow rapidly. People are living longer, and there's certainly just more in the demographic of boomers uh, that are entering into their 60s uh, and, and retirement age. Now, what this means for income investing is that um, there's just a whole lot more investors who need income in their portfolios. Uh, no matter how aggressive your portfolio is, as you get into your late 60s, early 70s, you are likely having to shift your portfolio to generate more income. It's moved from a growth phase to a payout phase. Um, you know, if you think of things like your retirement RIFs and your RSPs after 70 turning into RIFs, you know, it's just the nature of, 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 of the life, um, life cycle where you're likely looking to draw down on your portfolio, no matter how large it is, to generate an income to fund retirement expenses or semi-retirement expenses. For that reason, um, you know, we're likely seeing for the, for the considerable future, uh, you know, a, a demand for fixed income, a demand for bonds, a demand for preferred shares, a demand for mutual funds and ETFs that pay an income because such a large swath of the Canadian demographic investor has turned this age. So this is really underpinning, above everything else, the need for income in portfolios and also some of the challenges that we've seen in portfolios. And I call this the income challenge. And um, some of you, particularly if you're income investors, uh, I was I was a kid, but I still even remember vividly. You may remember uh, the hamburger commercial from the 1980s, where that uh, elderly lady would uh, get her hamburger and yell, "You know, where's the beef?" Well, you know, we are at, we find ourselves asking a similar question in terms of where's the yield today? You know, it wasn't that long ago, going back to about 22, 23 years, where you could generate a yield that was, you know, sort of in the eight to 9% range um, without a whole lot of risk. Uh, GICs back in the early 1980s probably paid in excess of 10%, in some cases 12%. We've all heard the stories of mortgages that were 18%. A very different environment that we find ourselves in today. First of all, if I look at the equity side of the portfolio, um, you know, this is a higher return over the long run, um, but also have generally lower yields. Uh, not only that, um, certainly valuations on equities are at all-time highs. So um, I'm not making the case here saying you should be selling your equity portfolio. You need a diversification of equities and income. But it, it, you know, it, certainly at any given point in the last decade, we're looking at valuations of equities that are substantially high, particularly on things like dividend-paying stocks. On the other side of the portfolio, really where we're talking about mainly today, on the income side, we're looking at low yields. So even with rising interest rates, we're basically having interest rates rise from close to zero, or in some cases of the world, negative, to positive territory. 
Um, but you'd be fooling yourselves if you thought that this is some sort of hyperinflationary environment. Uh, indeed, it's it's extremely low interest rates of what we've seen historically. So for investors that are transitioning from a portfolio uh, where they need to be focusing on more income, unfortunately, uh, they're, foc they're, they're transitioning at a time where income is just generally harder to find without taking on more risk. So again, as we move through this presentation, hopefully we find some ways for us to hit a sweet spot where we can find ways to generate an attractive level of income without taking on too much risk. And just to show you again what I'm talking about here, here's your U.S. Treasury, the 10-year from 1962 to 2016. And if we look at, if we look at sort of this area here, we see going into 1980s um, this huge amount of economic growth in the United States, and the Treasury just did nothing but go up. So had you been an income investor at that point in time, your yield was high, but your returns were were low because you're you lost money on the bonds you held. Um, as many of you were, you know, something to highlight here, bonds are inversely correlated, bond prices are inversely correlated to interest rates. So as interest rates rise, bonds that currently exist see their prices decline to keep pace with interest rates. So you lose money on the one side while you gain money on the other. It's sort of like a, a pendulum. Um, where you see on the other side here, though, so the last 36 years, and really, if you look here, it's only the first time in almost a decade or, or eight years where we've seen rates start to meaningfully rise, but you've generally not lost any money at all on owning bonds for uh, well, going on the last 40 years now, almost 36 years. Uh, this is really unprecedented. There's really been nothing in history like this in terms of seeing the amount of time where interest rates have declined and therefore holding your bonds, they've always generated a positive return. Um, but, uh, you know, even if rates were to go up to 5%, that is double where we are today. And maybe we have hit an inflection point, uh, particularly as we move into 2017, where this, this may be changing. Next slide here. So what's the big difference between bonds and equity ETFs? Because obviously this is an ETF presentation. Well, the first thing to understand is that bonds uh, are not listed on an exchange. They trade over the counter. And so certainly you can buy bonds from some of your brokerage accounts, um, but the mechanisms by which they trade are very different than you would typically have with, uh, <clears throat> with, with equities in that um, they're held over the counter and their pricing is opaque, meaning that you don't actually know how much of a commission you're paying on the bond and how much of it is actual security that you're paying. Whereas with a listed stock exchange that trades in a stock exchange, you know what the price is and then ancillary to that are the trading costs. Um, because the fees and bonds are not transparent, uh, historically they could be quite expensive. We used to have a joke <clears throat> around the office um, where or on Bay Street where um, you know you always knew who an equity trader was because they drove a Mercedes or BMW and you always knew who a bond trader was because they drove a Lamborghini or a Ferrari uh, you know I don't know if that holds true today but the point is the amount of money that bond dealers made was quite a bit more on the commissions than stocks because of that lack of transparency by not being uh, listed on an exchange they also have um, much less liquidity than stocks bonds are a closed amount of issuance uh, of debt, uh, usually a float that's much smaller than the equities, and as a result, it's tightly controlled by many, especially in Canada, the large bank dealerships. So the bond the liquidity of bonds is heavily reliant on the availability of inventory of dealers to be able to offer those. Um, so when ETFs came into the market, um, they've actually been a, a great way to create a, what we call shine a light on the bond market because what effectively they do is they create transparent pricing. Uh, the ETF is the one that buys the bonds and of course it uses institutional portfolio management to buy those bonds and therefore it gets preferred pricing on the commissions and also it creates liquidity because ETFs trade like a stock on an exchange so therefore they have transparent pricing and depth of liquidity and so it's allowed uh, investors of all stripes, and in fact, you'll notice that most bond ETFs are held by uh, small investors with $100 to $200 in the market to massive multi-billion dollar pension funds and institutional funds at the same time because it's become in very many ways the most efficient and transparent way to hold uh, bonds. Um, equity ETFs have certainly had a similar type 
of movement, but actually in the last four or five years, even if I look at Canada, for example, last year, one out of every two dollars that went into the Canadian ETF market went into bond ETFs. So this is really, ETF structure, even more so than stocks, has really revolutionized, revolutionized the way that we buy bonds and fixed income. But you do need to understand the difference between how some of these products are, stu are set up. So the majority of uh, bond ETFs or fixed income ETFs in Canada are index ETFs. And uh, by index, I mean that they are passively managed passively managed product means that there's not a portfolio manager there picking things that they think are undervalued and selling things they think are overvalued and trying to find ways to generate excess return. The uh, ETF itself is simply tracking an index methodology, which is a rules of, of bonds that are held in a certain way following those rules. Well, it's very simple to f understand most stock methodology. So, if again, I'm going to pull the highlighter here. But if we look on the uh, right-hand side here, we see the S&P 500, the largest stock index in the world, and we see how all these stocks are held uh, by their market capitalization. The word market capitalization sounds a little jargony. What it effectively means is the size of the company. The bigger the company in terms of its relative size to the rest of the um, corporate America the size of its weight. So if the 500 largest stocks in the United States, Apple would have a weight of 3% and being much the biggest weight of those five proportional of those 500 stocks. Microsoft's number two, Exxon Mobile's number three. And this is a pretty decent way to, to hold stocks because as the company grows in size, it grows in its weighting to the portfolio. And of course, as it's growing, the portfolio is doing better uh, that stock price is doing better, the portfolio is doing better. So it's a, a fairly efficient and default way to get exposure to a stock. As it grows, obviously a stock that's growing in size is generally doing relatively well from a pricing perspective. We move back to the left-hand side though, we see with bonds this is something very different. If I look at the largest corporate bond index in, the, in North America, it's an American corporate bond index, I see that the weights are actually designed to based on outstanding debt. That is, the companies that have the most amount of debt are the largest holdings in the index. So, if I look at Anheuser-Busch InBev, which has a lot of debt because it keeps merging and acquiring different beer companies, we can see that it represents one, two, three, four, five of the top five of top ten holdings because of the amount of debt it has. Now, that's not a terrible metric of which to build a bond index, but certainly, if someone told me what companies would you like to hold uh, in your portfolio, I probably wouldn't have a problem with the larger companies, where I may have a bit of an issue with holding the, the bonds of the companies that have the most amount of bonds on the market. They can clearly service those bonds, but it's not necessarily the best way to look at that. So this in itself creates a certain amount of inefficiency for bond indexing, as well as it creates a certain amount of inefficiency from a liquidity standpoint, because um, you know, often some of these bonds don't trade quite as well as you would see with something like Apple Incorporated. So these are, this is a very key difference between how stock and bond indices are generally built. And if you see most bond ETFs in Canada, um, I'm not saying they're a bad product. In fact, they're a very low cost way to get exposure to different types of tranches of bond exposure. You can get corporate bond, a government bond, you can get different sets of years, so bonds that mature in one year, bonds that mature in 10 years. You can slice and dice your exposure, but most of the time if they're built as an index strategy, they're weighting the bond based on its relative outstanding debt. So, and, and this again it highlights again going back some of the risk of owning bonds in, in today's market, and uh, the big one being not interest rate risk. Um, right now interest rate risk is probably at an all-time high uh, from a historical standpoint uh, other than of course going back to maybe more than 40 years ago in the in the heyday of the mid-1970s and hyperinflation. But what was important to understand if I went back to the 1970s is that I had high yields uh, which somewhat offset the um, <clears throat> the interest rate, rapid rise of interest rates. Uh, today, though, we're coming off a base of extremely low interest rates, which actually dramatically enhances the risk of owning bonds today. So again, if you go back to that second slide, I talked about the challenge, the income challenge in fixed income investing today, and really what I'm talking about is the fact that there's so much risk in being in a fixed income investor, and this slide sort of summarizes why. If I took a Canadian 10-year bond, 
and I looked at where it was at in 1990, I would generally see that the 10-year bond was sort of in the 10.5% yield range, right? Uh, the coupon was 10.5. It had a duration of 10 years, meaning that the duration you would, before you got paid out of all the, the uh, coupons would be about 10 years and a price of $100. Well, the way that bonds are priced is basically that for every 1% increase of yield, a bond or 1% increase of, of interest rates, a bond would be expected to lose 1% of its price return. So certainly having a 10-year duration bond with a 10.5% yield, it means that it, you would generate 10.5% if all things being equal and interest rates didn't rise. Now, if I was to see a... 1% increase of yield in 1990, my 10.5% bond with its 10 years of duration would be expected to lose about, <clears throat> would be expected to lose about, um, well, so, sorry, with 10.5, I would still have a positive net return because I would gain 10.5%, but I would lose 10% on the I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to explain again. I would have 10.5% interest rate, and so I would gain that as a 10.5% return. I would lose 10% on the duration if 1% rise of increase occurred, but I would still have a positive return of 0.5%. So not bad. I mean, it's not great. Probably didn't buy the bond expecting to have just 0.5% of return, but from a risk perspective, my return was still positive, even despite the fact of a big move in, 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 in yield. Today we find ourselves in a very different environment where if I look at the same sort of uh, analogy in 2016, at the end of 2016 last year, uh, a 1.5% uh, yield is sort of what I'm earning on a 10-year bond. It's probably closer to 1.8 now, but it's not a whole lot more than this. My duration is 10 years, so if interest rates go up 1%, I'm going to lose 10% one year for every year, 1% for every year of duration, which means my price drops to $90 and I've lost 8.5%, or roughly, if we look at this, probably about six to seven years of income on this particular product. This is a huge negative return for our portfolio or asset class, which is supposed to be conservative and not supposed to lose uh, these kind of returns. But this is the risk we find ourselves in today. Interest rate risk, this is this duration risk that I'm talking about over here, is something that's very real today and something you need to be cognizant of. And so there's a hierarchy of yielding investments and credit risk that you need to be aware of. And generally speaking, um, it works this way in that there's there's two really main types of risk on, on bond investing. So I just talked about the interest rate risk, which is the duration risk. And there's also credit risk. Credit risk being the likelihood that an underlying provider of fixed income or a preferred share would be able to provide you um, the debt if they were to find themselves in financial impairment. So you end up with what we call a hierarchy of yielding investments and credit risk. So generally, the lower risk, lower yield, lower risk is constitutes lower yield, and in some cases constitutes um, some interest rate risk, but generally lower risk. So something like government bonds are extremely low on the credit ladder. Corporate bonds are a little bit higher. That's based on balance sheets of corporates. Preferred shares, which are non-secured debt, that's at basically functions like equity, just one level above uh, equity investors is slightly higher risk. Then you get into high yield bonds, dividend paying stocks, and cover call writing. So as we go through today, I've talked about interest rate risk. The other risk also you need to be aware of is this one credit risk right here. So we have the two key risks here, and, our, and your goal as an income investor is to maximize your yield without taking on too much risk on either one of these different portions of the portfolio. And we'll talk quickly about how some of these different areas work. The other thing to keep in mind also is the impact of higher management fees. And this again is really what's Draw, driven a lot of assets towards bond ETFs and why you see more Canadian investors off, opting to go with ETFs, which are generally have much lower management fees than uh, bond mutual funds or buying bonds outright with an embedded commission. Um, here we see that if we look at the cost of higher management fees over a 10-year period, so if I had a $100,000 uh, income investment that generates, let's say, annualized 4% annual return, 
um, you know, sort of in the yield that you would expect from maybe a uh, preferred share or a corporate bond product. Um, you can see the difference here in management fees. Now, management fees on mutual fund bond mutual funds tend to be lower than equity mutual funds, but they're still sort of in the 1 to 1.5 percent range. Um, and so we've got fund A with a management fee of 1.6 percent, and we have fund B with a <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, a 0.5% management fee. Now keep in mind that's actually probably even a little bit high for a lot of fixed income um, products. There's a lot of ETFs in the marketplace uh, now that are down in around the 20 basis point mark. And in fact, there's even one fixed income ETF in Canada now. It's only nine basis points. But we're in a low yield environment, and so even even with 4%, though, we can see that the management of the management fees significantly erode the return. If I was to hold both these investments and I had the same 4% annualized return and the same performance trajectory, all things being equal except the management fee, I would see here that I would save myself an additional $14,294 over the course of 10 years. That's significant. That's a 14% return, um, you know, and uh, that's um, a significant amount of money at the end of a decade that you would have saved by purely opting for a lower fee product. And this is really what's driving people towards fixed income ETFs is because I know I have sort of a capped return profile probably in the, let's say, 3 to 6% range. So every basis point of management fee I pay extra to get that exposure, I need the portfolio manager to be doing something extraordinary to outperform, which is hard to do in fixed income in order for me to really come out ahead instead of opting for a low-cost ETF product. And so I'm just quantifying that there, but it ends up being about $14,300. It's even more significant, though, when we talk about our transition to the drawdown phase. Of course, a lot of people that are in fixed income investing are looking for uh, generate an income. Well, you have, to re you have to realize now that if I'm generating an income, each time that I pull money out of the portfolio, I'm reducing the amount of principal from which it to grow, of course, because of the nature of compounding. So if I take the same hypothetical example, but I put it in a case where the investor is now withdrawing $10,000 each year for 10 years, well, now those fees, you get a negative compounding of the higher fee product where the same the same comparison during a drawdown phase shows a difference of $32,000. Now remember, this original portfolio um, was $100,000, of course it's significantly higher as it's compounded over time, but we were starting with roughly about $130,000 portfolio value over a year, and it's dropped to the case where I still have $81,000 after 10 years with the lower fee product, and I only have $49,000 with the higher fee product. So there's not any, very few things you can control in investing. Um, certainly can't control the markets, you can't control central banks or the economy, but you can control the amount of uh, cost you get access to that. And it, as I can highlight here, it's a simple but yet very profound way which you can generate higher returns. So again, that's what the exchange traded funds do. And um, you know, again, just to, to highlight what, you know, it's an open and investment fund, it's listed and traded on an exchange, and it generally offers passive or lower cost exposure. Now that's index ETFs, there's also active ETFs, and in Canada, this is extremely important to understand, it's, it's very unique to the Canadian marketplace, but in Canada, about one out of every three ETFs is actively managed. A lot of people don't realize that, and it represents about 15% of the assets under management in Canada, but even more profound is that it represents a huge, much larger proportion of fixed income. So fixed income, most of the active ETFs in Canada are in the fixed income market. And that's again because of certain important characteristics that a fixed income manager, assuming that they're provided at a low cost, can do, such as provide investment expertise. They can generally reduce the typical higher cost trading, look at liquidity, and they can undertake uh, credit analysis of the underlying securities. Remember, the fixed income market is an OTC market, meaning it's non-transparent, meaning you don't always have all the information to work with that you would with equities, and so having a professional portfolio manager, particularly in Canada, which tends to have a less liquid fixed income marketplace, can result in uh, meaningful performance. So there's two types of ETFs we're going to talk about. There's the index ETFs, which I primarily talked about at this point, and there's active ETFs, which are ETFs that use a portfolio manager.
And the first strategy I'm talking about here is just one that may be very, uh, you may not have ever heard of, but it's actually a floating rate bond ETF strategy. And given today's rising interest rate market, uh, this is probably something of some interest to many of the people on the call today or on our webinar today. Um, so the ETF I'm talking about is one example of a floating rate bond ETF, and it's called the Horizons Active Floating Rate Bond ETF. So active denotes that there is a portfolio manager selecting the bonds, and the underlying bonds in the portfolio are managed to have a floating rate, meaning that as interest rates rise, the yield of the product also rises, meaning it protects, on the duration side, it protects the portfolio. Now this product yields about 2% and has a management fee of 0.40%. Um, but unlike other bond strategies, the uh, general investment grade corporate bond universe in Canada has, yields about 3.3%, about but has a duration in the five year range. So for every, uh, let's say 1% of interest rate, you'd be expected to lose about 5% in those strategies. If it's 50 basis points, you'd be expected to lose 2.5% using the same math, or basically a year's worth of yield. What uh, HFR and similar ETFs do is they effectively eliminate the duration risk, and of course it does result in a lower yield, but it reduces that key risk we talked about, which was interest rate risk, and therefore allows you to have an income strategy, particularly something as a cash alternative or a conservative fixed income alternative that is protected from interest rates. So some of the uh, the big reasons why you might want to look at something like this is it offers a higher current income than Canadian money market securities. Uh, most money markets are yielding, I think, in the range of about 20 to 30 basis points. Even GICs right now, even if you get a good rate, um, it's likely not over 2% unless there's some sort of crazy teaser for a long-term holdup. And you have to realize that as interest rates rise, while GIC 100% protects your principal, it uh, doesn't... Uh, necessarily take advantage of rising interest rates. You're locked into that GIC while interest rates rise, so you're leaving returns on the table. A floating rate corporate bond ETF would see its interest rates obviously rise immediately with underlying interest rates, sorry, its yield rise with underlying interest rates, and therefore you're getting more of the return potential that's being given to you by the fixed income market. And of course, it's also preserving capital because you're able to take advantage of, of the fact that it's not doesn't have interest rate risk. Also, this product is, because it's corporate bonds, you're also building in the attractive credit risk premium, which is about 1% more than you expect on a government bond. So this is one of our most popular strategies this year. Uh, we've raised, uh, we've probably had about $40 million coming into this this year, and it's about a $400 million ETF for us. And it's a lot of investors that are using this instead of holding treasuries, which are low risk, but have a lot of interest rate risk, they're offering to move to something like this instead where they can generate a yield of 2% but not have to worry about the underlying value of the bond portfolio declining as interest rates rise. And so again, just how this would work is it generally has, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a combination of the yield is a combination of what we call a corporate spread. Um, I'm going to take one step back, actually. The way this ETF works is it enters into something called an interest rate swap with a large game financial institution. So it pays a fixed uh, interest rate and, in ex and, and, and then in exchange gets a floating uh, interest rate, which is called CDOR, the Canadian Dealer Offer Rate, which is the floating interest rate that banks pay to each other. So your combination of that 2% of yield is a combination of the amount of yield that you keep from the corporate yield from the bond portfolio plus the CDOR, um, the CDOR, the floating rate. So that's what gives you your 2%. And the thing to understand is that if CDOR was to rise, then there's really no effect on the ETF yield. If CDOR goes up or down, there's no effect on the ETF, the ETF yield. Um, and if corporate spreads go up or down, there could be a little bit of an impact on the pricing, but generally speaking, this ETF tends to trade in and around, let's say, 980 to 1015, very similar to a money market fund, where the NAV stays steady and just pays out that yield. Now, of course, another, as we talk about different kinds of strategies, that's that's on a fixed income strategy right now that we think is, is an interesting strategy for uh, clients to be looking at, and again, uh, not necessarily an advertisement for us. You can look at floating rate bond strategies through other providers, but the point what I'm trying to make here is that the, probably the single most profound way that you can f 
you can protect your fixed income portfolio, particularly over the next 12 to 18 months as interest rates are look look poised to rise. We know the Fed is is gung ho about doing three interest rates rises in 2017. Um, is to look at products that have the low duration or floating rate. Um, strategies. Protecting your principal during this period uh, could be a meaningful way for you to protect the long-term uh, performance potential of your fixed income portfolio. Of course, you can always again look at dividends also as a source of returns in a rising interest rate environment. Why is that? Well, valuations on, on dividend stocks are relatively high, but at the same token, you can generate an income that's not as as negatively impacted by interest rates. And so one of the strategies I'm mentioning here is the Horizons Active Global Dividend ETF, which is ticker symbol HAZ. And this is an actively managed investment strategy that invests in sort of 50 or 60 of the largest dividend paying companies in the world. And so the active manager uses both a quantitative, meaning a number of, of basic investment metrics through a computer screen as well as qualitative looking at the underlying cash flows and quality of the companies to select companies that pay a dividend but also have attractive total return key being their total return performance potential meaning they can deliver a good combination of both uh, price return and dividend return and this again is a large ETF for us and it's done extraordinarily well over the last few years in high having high quality lower risk um, stocks that pay a dividend. And why is that important? Well, one thing I want you to keep in mind here is, is particularly with longevity risk, as you look to, and when I talk about longevity risk, I'm talking about how long your retirement might end up being, you know, you'd probably need to have quite a bit more, regardless of what your age is on this call or this webinar, you need to have more equity exposure than you've probably had uh, in previous generations. So, you know, our parents and grandparents probably would have been fine with a primarily 80 to 90 percent fixed income portfolio as they moved into retirement. Um, but again, their uh, retirement was likely 5 to 15 years as opposed to many Canadians who will have a retirement in excess of 20 to 30 years. Um, that means you need a lot of growth potential in your portfolios. So the combination of dividends and growth means you should probably be looking at large, lower risk dividend paying global securities to provide you equity exposure and provide you income. And that's not a bad thing because if I take the MSCI world here and I'm going to pull out my highlighter, you can see that the MSCI world uh, generally offered, um, basically it's the 3,000 largest stocks in the world, um, you know, large caps across the world, the developed world. Uh, and we can see the world index total return, that's price return plus index return and we can see the price return, which is just the price of the stock's going up. Well, you can see here, that actually, that dividends, after you factor in compounding over time, account for a massive amount of that total return. The total return of the MSCI world is well over 500%, where the MSCI world was around 300% <coughs> on the price return. The differential then means that the dividends being paid, because again, Dividends are paid in these areas of financial impairment, such as the you know financial crisis, the tech wreck here. It provides a compounding over time, and if that's three or four percent a year being compounded, it results in a significant amount of performance. So, if you're an income investor, you need to be looking at both sides of your portfolio. You need to be looking at your fixed income portfolio, which is primarily what we talked about before this. Looking at things like credit risk and interest rate risk, and if you're looking on your equity portfolio as well, though, is a powerful way for you to continue to generate, let's say, a yield in the 4% range, most drawdown targets for most actuaries and, and portfolio managers about 4%. You can generate some of that on your equity portfolio, which allows you to maintain a larger amount of your portfolio in equities, which allows you to have a little bit more uh, return pr profile and return performance over the longevity of your portfolio, because hopefully, you know, most of us on, are going to live longer than you know, previous generations. And again, just what this strategy is doing is it's looking at three different aspects. It's looking at growth, payout, and sustainability. I would argue that most active strategies in Canada are, are well versed in looking at the growth and payout of the stocks. What they're usually not looking at very much is sustainability. That's the likelihood of the stocks to continue to pay out a yield. And that's really the, the risk management of the strategy and that's where this strategy that this ETF offers a lot of advantages 
and that it's always looking to see whether these companies can continue to pay out a yield. Um, by doing so, looking at the corporate balance sheet health of companies, it's not picking the companies with the highest payouts, it's picking the companies that have a combination of payout and sustainability, which does a good job of protecting the downside risk of the portfolio. And therefore, you get different sets of stocks, such as dividend payers, which are mature growth. These are your utilities, your telecoms, your dividend growers. These are companies like McDonald's, Starbucks, and dividend achievers. These are actually companies that don't pay high dividends, but have moved, such as like Apple, <coughs> into a phase where they're starting to become more mature and have a lot of cash in their balance sheet. And they're starting to pay, but they offer a lot more of the price return than the dividend return that you see on the payers combination of all three is extremely important for you to have in the fixed income portfolio. Now you can use ETFs um, either individually or in one shot like this to get exposure to these kind of companies that offer you that good combination of total return for your equity portfolio. Another interesting strategy right now are preferred shares and the reason preferred shares are very interesting right now is that they have a positive correlation to interest rates. So when I'm talking about positive correlation to interest rates, I mean that the value of preferred shares tends to increase in Canada as interest rates rise. And that's because the majority of preferred shares in Canada have a capital structure, which means that the yield uh, resets to a higher rate that's spread above the Canada five-year bond. So as interest rates rise, the anticipated yield when the preferred shares reset should be higher. So their price performance tends to do quite well in a rising interest rate environment. In fact, we've seen preferred shares over the last year. Uh, we're up over 30% going into March. So, I mean, this has been a, a huge asset class in terms of, of, of capturing a lot of the upward movement of, of <clears throat> interest rates. Not only that, though, which I think is really important to highlight, preferred shares have also uh, pay out a tax efficient dividend. So they still pay over over 4% in Canada, but that's taxed at a Canadian dividend eligible tax rate as opposed to an income tax rate, which means that the yield is more like getting a bond that pays 6% because a bond is taxed as income. And so at your higher marginal tax rate, that would get taken down by, you know, 40% or so um, from the CRA, where this would only be taken down about 30% or so maybe even less than that depending on your income tax rate. So you're getting a yield that's more like 6%. Uh, very attractive asset class. We have an actively managed preferred share strategy. There's only about $60 billion in preferred shares in Canada. And so as a result, um, it is a very constrained market where an inefficient market where we think active management offers a lot of advantages. Fier Capital manages our Horizons active preferred share ETF trades in the ticker symbol HPR. It's a billion dollar ETF. There's a billion dollars in assets in this ETF. And the reason that it's become so popular is because it's a case where active management has significantly outperformed the index strategies in the market because they're not forced to buy and sell illiquid securities. They're not forced to buy and sell um, low rate reset um, preferred shares. These are preferred shares that reset to a lower rate than you would see um, in the market, the current market. And obviously that's a negative performance indicator. So all of those things, plus its institutional pricing power, has generated about 200 to 500 uh, basis points or 2 to 5% of outperformance per year versus the index, which has resulted, as we can see, in a much better return trajectory than these other strategies. And in fact, if you look uh, going back over the last year, you can see that um, <clears throat> this has generated about a 23.24% return. Um, and since its inception, um, the latter preferred share index ETF is negative. The other one's flat, and this one's about 2.11% per year. So active management, which is only 10 basis points more than index strategy, has generated significant outperformance. Finally, I'm going to talk about cover calls. Now, cover calls are something that, um, you know, again, this is going back to the equity portfolio. This is a way for you to potentially increase the income on your equity portfolio while maintaining an allocation to equities. Uh, what I do want to highlight with cover calls, I'm just looking at my time here, I've got about five minutes. Um, when I'm looking at cover calls, you know, cover calls are generally, um, you know, they are an income strategy, but they're an equity strategy. So I like to tell investors that when you're looking at a cover call strategy, which for those of you not familiar with, means that I'm holding a basket of stocks and then I'm selling calls, 
I'm selling calls to other investors in the secondary market for them to have the obligation to buy my stock at a future price. And usually uh, we set that price out of the money, meaning that price would be higher than what it is today. So the stock would have to go up for the call to be exercised and for you to have to either roll the call or sell the stock. And of course, in the case of ETFs, we do this for you. Historically, we've seen this kind of strategy tends to do relatively well in three market conditions. It does well in a bear market, clearly because stock price goes down, but you've captured the um, covered call premium. It does well in a range-bound market. Again, the stock doesn't really go up, but I've captured the premium. And sometimes, I would argue, this is a little bit, a little bit pushing it, but modest bull market um, where it may outperform uh, depending on how much the stocks go up. If you've written calls that are higher than the stock's gone up, you still end up ahead. Of course, in a powerful bull market, like we've seen since 2013, these underperform because the stocks are running through their call prices, and so you're getting the call premium, but you're losing out on some of the price return of the stocks. But in today's market of high valuations and the fact that more investors are looking for income in their portfolios, um, this kind of strategy may offer some advantages, uh, particularly for those liking to stay in the equity market. And again, I'm just highlighting how this would work. You could write a stock at, let's say, that's 5% out of the money um, based on um, you know, a $100 um, stock. And so basically, the stock would have to run through $105 in order for you to not end up ahead with this strategy. So you're, if it was to stay a below $105 or it was to move to $105, just $205, you could end up with a return of about $106. Um, but if it ran above, you'd be capped at your maximum of $106 and could lose out on further returns. But you're still a net positive in a rising market. Um, on a downside market, of course, the premium would give you $1, 1% of protection in this resolve. So you'd have more uh, capital similar to dividends uh, providing an offset to losses which could compound at a future date. So it's a lower risk, higher income way for you to hold equities with a high amount of beta or correlation to the equity market. Again, this is something I recommend for, um, or you know, I'm not te technically recommending, but something to consider uh, for investors that again need to stay in the equity market but need probably more income than what some other uh, portfolio or equity strategies are offering them. Um, so the way that our ETFs do this approach is the portfolio will generally sell or write the short term slightly out of the money call options, which are set at the underlying volatility of the stock. So a stock like RBC, which is relatively low volatility, they probably write closer to the money, whereas a gold stock or an energy stock, which is highly volatile, they write farther out of the money, allowing for a greater likelihood the stock won't run through its strike price. So you get the combination of the price return plus the premium rather than losing out on the, the price return of the stock. And so it's sort of a best of both worlds. And the advantages of the, using an ETF strategy, and we're not the only provider in Canada, there's a number of cover call strategies offered by BMO as well, so you know, feel free to do your due diligence or research there, but the key benefits of the ETF versus DIY is few portfolio managers or investors have extensive experience in option trading. It's an extremely difficult market to manage and price properly. We have a portfolio management team that manages over $600 million globally in these kind of assets and have, you know, core, um, <coughs> 40 years of experience between the two of them doing options trading. Also, it allows for an effective diversification of cover call strategy. Instead of doing three stocks, you're doing 40 to 50 stocks, which provides a better, you know, for a larger account portfolio size. For you as a client to manage 40 or 50 cover call strategies would be extremely time consuming, and ETF does it for you. And we have a whole family of cover call ETFs. And what I really just want to highlight here is that these ETFs allow you to, um, you know, get exposure to the different types of markets. So the HEX is the Canadian equities, 30 largest Canadian stocks. HEF is a Canadian bank and insurance stocks. HEE is a Canadian energy stocks. HEP is the gold producer stocks. This is outperformed the gold market over the long term because that's been a negative market. So HEP has been a great way to get most of the rally that occurred in gold stocks last year, but that high yield of the 6 to 7% range. International stocks for HEJ, US stocks for HEA, and we even do cover calls on things like gold. 
So if you think historically gold, people hold gold, you don't earn income from that. The Horizons Gold Yield ETF writes cover calls on 30% of the portfolio to generate an income. So you get two-thirds of the upside, 60% of the upside of the gold price, plus you get income generated for that as well. And we write it on natural gas, which has a high yield because it's a volatile asset class. I'm always cognizant of the fact that this 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 is a long presentation. I try to get them done in 45 minutes. I believe I've done it in 50 minutes today. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, and I hope that you know really this is just the start of you looking and thinking about how you manage income and the risk of income investing in your portfolio. Um, you know the need for income has never been greater, uh, but you need to keep in mind that in a low rate environment, you got to keep management fees low. You need to look at rising interest rates. And you maybe want to look at protecting against rising rates on the other side of your portfolio by offering things like preferred shares and covered call equities. So without any further ado, um, I'll mention that you know you can contact us anytime at the following, and I'll look at uh, some of the questions that are likely uh, built up here. So uh, does anyone else uh, have any questions here? I've got one question so far. Okay. Says uh, one quick question: Do all Horizons ETFs do cover calls? As the titles you listed do not explicitly state so. Uh, no, not all Horizons ETFs do cover calls. The only cover call ETFs that we offer um, to go back here on sorry on the portfolio here. Close this question box. So to go back on the portfolio here, if we go back, these are our cover call ETFs for your question. So these are the only cover call ETFs we currently offer. And again, we offer ETFs to give you non-covered call exposure to Canadian equities and financials. Uh, HXT, which is an ETF that's three basis points, would give you the same sort of beta or correlated exposure, but it wouldn't have the covered call. So if you're asking specifically about covered call ETFs, these are the ETFs that we offer that give you exposure to these types of, of uh, strategies. I'm looking here for questions here. I have a question on our cannabis ETF. Um, I'm not surprised by that. Um, yes, we have a uh, marijuana ETF in Canada, and uh, it's quickly become the uh, fastest growing ETF uh, in our family in, in quite some time, probably in the Canadian marketplace. It currently has about 80 to $90 million in assets under management less than a week, and it offers exposure to uh, 14, currently 14 marijuana producers and marijuana companies involved in the medical marijuana industry. No recreational marijuana exposure since that's illegal. These are companies dealing primarily in the Canadian medical marijuana market or companies that legally support it from the US. So it's um, North American Marijuana Index is the index that it tracks and provides a diversified relatively low cost exposure to a very new but I should underscore very volatile equity sector. I could probably do a whole new presentation of that. But uh, someone asked the question, so I, I'm just addressing that. Are there any other questions today? All right, if that's it, I'll uh, throw it back to Con Leaf. But thank you very much. It's always a real pleasure to uh, to present for in for you all. Thank you, Mark. That uh, was a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, we hope that uh, your cold gets better shortly. So, what's next? You can view our web webinar recordings on our YouTube channel, or you can email us at education at scotiaitrade.com to request a copy of the recording link. After you exit the webinar session, a short survey will load in your web browser. We ask that you uh, complete that for us, as it will help us to gauge our efforts here at Scotia iTrade and our educational offerings uh, as to whether or not it's satisfying your needs and then we can continue to tweak that to uh, make it better for you. Mark your calendars coming forward we're going to be uh, hosting uh, Pro Market Advisors. They'll be doing a webinar geared towards our novice investors. It's going to be called Investing and Trading Myths. That'll be Tuesday, April 18th at 1 p.m. And the week following, we'll be doing uh, another presentation to the advanced uh, investors uh, hosted by the Montreal Exchange. This will be in a bullish market. And that's on Tuesday, April 25th, also at 1 p.m. 
we welcome you just to visit our education calendar, events calendar, and register for any one of the upcoming webinars uh, that might suit you. As mentioned, uh, if you just go to scotiaitrade.com, click on the education tab, and in events calendar, you'll see our calendar there. You can then register for one of the webinars. Um, if you see any past webinars, just go to our YouTube um, link to download those presentations as well too. So on behalf of Scotia iTrade, I would like to thank Mark Noble from Horizons ETFs, and I would also like to thank all of you for attending this presentation. The information was uh, amazing. Uh, we hope to see you again as we host additional webinars. Thank you so much.